Okay, welcome everybody. I hope you had a nice lunch. Uh, thank you everyone who's organizing the lunch for us. That worked, worked very nicely. Uh, so I've heard nice things about the conversation before lunch. That's nice to applaud for lunch, yes indeed. Glory, could you just put your hand up so folk can see you? Thanks, Glory, for everything. Glory is the, uh, the brains and the genius behind all of the organizational aspects of the conference. All the details that you must know go on. That's Glory's genius, so we're very grateful for that. And my doctoral students are just wonderful support in doing all that they do. Uh, and you can see them at the registration desk, holding the microphones and so on. Okay, so again, let me remind you, in case there's anyone new, there's a reduced parking rate to access the $5 rate when you're driving out. Do not use the parking machine. Take your car and your card, your parking ticket, to the attendant as you drive out and say you're from the conference, and you'll get the reduced rate. Thank you. So we're going to do this afternoon what we did this morning. We're going to have a plenary session with Professor Laurie uh, Zola. We're going to then have a little break and then a breakout session for concurrent papers. And then we'll come back and have the hours conversation again together. All right? So it's my pleasure to introduce the afternoon by asking uh, Darlene Weaver, Professor Weaver from Theology, to come forward and uh, introduce uh, Professor Zola. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to introduce our next plenary speaker, Dr. Lori Zoloth. Dr. Zoloth is Professor of Religious Studies in the Department of Religious Studies and Professor of Bioethics and Medical Humanities at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. Professor Zoloth also serves as Director of the Brady Program in Ethics and Civic Life at Northwestern. From 1995 to 2003, she was Professor of Ethics and Director of the Program in Jewish Studies at San Francisco State University. In 2001, she was President of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities. She has been a member of the NASA National Advisory Council, the nation's highest civilian advisory board for NASA, for which she received the NASA Public Service Medal the NASA Planetary Protection Advisory Committee, and the Executive Committee of the International Society for Stem Cell Research. She also chairs, in her spare time, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute's Bioethics Advisory Board. Dr. Zoloth is a prolific scholar. Her publications number around 200 and range topically from genetics and the human future to nanotechnology, oncofertility, biosecurity, avian flu, concern for the poor in Judaism, to children in the foster care system. Her published work includes 10 edited volumes and essays such as Justice in the Margins of the Land, Jewish Responses to the Challenges of Biotechnology, Religion and the Public Discourse of Bioethics, and I Want You, and Ethics of Hospitality for Bioethics. In 2014, Dr. Zoloth served as president of the American Academy of Religion, the major professional guild for scholars of religion. Dr. Zoloth selected climate change as the core moral issue of her presidency. Under her leadership, a third of the Academy's annual conference program was dedicated to climate change. Even more notable, Dr. Zoloth garnered national headlines, including a feature in the New York Times <clears throat> um, when she encouraged the Academy to consider taking a sabbatical year from its annual conference. Each year, approximately 10,000 scholars of religion descend upon an American or a Canadian city for their annual meeting the weekend before Thanksgiving. In her presidential address, Dr. Zoloth asked the Academy to consider canceling the conference for one year to save on the carbon emissions and financial expenditures associated with the annual gathering. As an alternative, Dr. Zoloth encouraged members to, quote, offer talks to the poor, 
in local high schools, community colleges, or the prison, the hospital, the military base, the church, mosque, synagogue, or temple. She asked, what if we turned to our neighbor, the woman who cleans the toilets, the man who sweeps the sidewalks, and included them in the university to which we are responsible? Considering the interdisciplinary breadth of her expertise, her manifest concern for the poor, and the moral imagination that animates her work, we are fortunate indeed to have Dr. Lori Zoloth with us. The title of her presentation is Risky Hospitality, Climate Change, Ethics, and the Stranger at Your Door. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lori Zoloth. Isn't that the nicest possible introduction? Thank you so much. So we've got a lot to do today. Um, these aren't pretty PowerPoints. They're handouts. And we're not destroying the trees by reading it. So I apologize for no pictures. I want to start by saying thank you um, to the wonderful Professor McGee and also to all the organizers who put together an extraordinary conference. Um, thank you to the, the, thinking about the premise, thank you for the Pope who's done such a lot for this conversation. And as an Orthodox Jew, I'm very proud of this Pope. I feel personally connected. Um, so good job. Ben. And thank you for all of you who are watching this um, sort of electronically on the streaming tape. It's a great thing to do streaming. And I welcome you to the talk, too. I want to begin by answering a question that just came up. This wasn't part of my talk, but someone said, how do we make a plan for a thousand years? So I'm going to quote from Hebrew Scriptures, um, which has a plan for a thousand years, um, from the morning prayer that said, the morning and the evening prayer that said by Jews, if you heed indeed my commandments, with which I charge you today, to love the Lord your God, worship him with all your heart and with all your soul, I will give rain to your land in its season, the early and the late rain, and you shall gather in your grain wine and oil. I, have, I will give you grass in your field for your cattle, and you shall eat and be satisfied. Be careful lest your heart be tempted, and you go astray and worship other gods, bowing down to them. And then the Lord's anger will flare against you, and he will close the heavens so there will be no rain. The land will not yield its crops, and you will perish swiftly from the good land that the Lord gave you. Therefore, set these words upon your heart and your soul. Bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be an emblem between your eyes. Teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit at your home, and when you travel on your way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. So, a prayer that's said twice a day by religious Jews, who should be in synagogue twice a day at least, and saying that's an Arminian. I want to begin with a prayer and end with a prayer, both um, used in Hebrew scripture. I'm a professor of bioethics and of religion, and my own research, when I am not thinking about science and there's ethical issues there, has turned to the great moral problem of climate change. As a philosopher, <clears throat> one way you can think about a problem is to create a thought experiment. So I'm going to try this with you. Imagine that you're a loyal government official, a scientist, charged with studying your country's climate. It takes you five years to write your report. You are a careful person. But as you tour the country's north, you find something strange. Whole villages are abandoned. Fields of peppers seem to have vanished. The, right, the rich cropland shifting under the yellow winds. You prepare a report for your president, a beautiful 164-page document with a picture of the country's most ancient and beautiful city on the front. In it, you explain that thousands and thousands of families have left the dying farms, which once provided 30% of the entire GDP of your country. And they're now streaming in their thousands into the cities. They need water, sanitation, health care, schools, and jobs. You tell the president that the region is staggering under a drought that has lasted now for four years. The worst drought ever recorded in the history of the country, one of the world's most fertile areas, the cradle of human civilization. But the president in question is not responsive. And the country in question is Syria. And this is no theoretical construct. This drama did take place in 2009. And as a million and a half internal refugees crowded outside of Aleppo and Damascus, 
the protests grew and the displaced demanded water. Two years later, 2011, thousands of frustrated landless farmers, a full quarter of the country's population, staged protests in the Arab Spring of 2011. But unlike other states of the region, like Libya, Egypt, or Tunisia, President Assad killed the protesters and bombed their neighborhoods. And thus begins the long civil war. It started over famine, over water, heat, the loss of land, the desperation of the homeless. It is these same families that now walk in the thousands and thousands and thousands into the cities of Europe. The dedicated scientist, Dr. Yusuf Mesmani, was the project director on this study. It was one of his last acts as a government official before he left the country in 2013 to escape spiraling levels of violence. It was the last report that Syria sent as a part of the UN IPCC. And it is why, in the fifth report, the prediction that the eastern Mediterranean will face increasing heat and drought is so very thorough. He saw it firsthand, the empty villages, the dry wells. Now, I'm an academic, just like Mr. Masami, but a moral philosopher, so all I have is words. So this is a talk about words, in particular talk about the words of faith. It'll have four parts. A justification for the imperative to talk about a specific critical issue. An analysis of our duty as people who call ourselves believers toward the public square. A brief journey into the theory of theological citizenship. And finally, a way to talk that I hope is a repair of ethics, using scriptural reasoning as to develop a moral gesture of hospitality as one preliminary response to the crisis to which we now speak. I am proposing um, something, beyond, something beyond mere study. I'm talking something towards a, a project that I call hospitality. I've said earlier I don't like the word sustainability. It's too um, accepting of that which is. Consider this thesis. Americans, as citizens of our country, also have duties to the world. Well, why? Well, first, because the capacity to live in our society is a privilege that is directly contingent on the duties carried by each of us within our society. But Americans who live in worlds that are relatively protected socially and physically, well, we hold more profound obligations. Our university campuses, for example, even if they're community colleges in the worst of the inner cities, are still protected by special police, still have light and are paved, uh, and are paved roads lined with trees, with libraries that open access to millions of texts, with safe and healthy food brought to campus, with watered lawns like parks, and tidy places to put our used Volvos and our new Priuses. It is a world beyond imagining for the vast majority of the world's poor. Our place, our location, our relative status as members in this sense of Pharaoh's court implies a duty for we are as Joseph, the interpreters, the analysts of the dreams of the past and the projects of the future. We are complicit in the organization of economies, the order of statecraft and institutions. Second, we have obligations that arise directly from the brokenness of the world, a contingent, fragile, and unfinished project that on its own, at the moment of rupture, interrupts the constancy of our being and pulls us to attention. The world comes to us is experienced by us, if we're at all alive, if we listen at all to the cries of the other, as a broken world. This is a scriptural truism, of course, but it's also a matter of data. Consider the number of people who are hungry, 805 million, or without clean water, one in every nine people in the world. The other side of the moral sense, in the moral sense of the fact that the world's brokenness, is the fact that we have the ability to repair, and this can implies ought. Third, the needs of the poor creates another justification for this duty. What I do, how I live, is a moral act, every single gesture. And while the gestures seem innocent, they're cumulative, and they set in motion a chain of action that, given the structure of exchange, is part of the systemic order of the world. And the world is so shaped, the production and exchange and consumption of the goods and the services, it is so shaped that the wealthiest have garnered the vast majority of wealth at the expense of the lives and the health of the poor. As readers of scripture, who of course know this, and who are deeply aware of the special regard, regarded place that poverty claims in scripture, we have a duty to speak to that regard. In Hebrew scripture, in the New Testament and the Quran, the relationships between production and the laws for, for structural clarity are made clear. Moreover, 
We have an obligation to teach the language of prophecy and of justice that such language implies. We have an obligation to teach our texts, as it's said in my, in my reading, and their real-world implications for social justice and structural political um, implications. It implies certain realities about the spread of, a, of, a, of the same seriousness that, for instance, a molecular biologist will teach that, that Darwin's text implies certain realities about the spread of adapting bacterial diseases, or that an engineer will call order structure on the basis of the facticity understood by Roman builders. Now, let me expand on this point. We now live in a world in which nearly every system of justice has been stripped of legitimacy. Socialism, much less communism, a courtly system of obligations, or the noblesse oblige expressed by local barons, or the rules of decency and polite conduct, manners, all of these are thrown over in the face of the justice of the marketplace, which despite having nearly collapsed in 2008, has recovered just enough so the economists can, with straight faces, argue that climate remediation plans are just too costly. Even the truth, the truth discourse, heretofore found in science, is funded by private capital, and the languages of the marketplace shape the notions of what it is to be worth something. Fourth, we're the sort of creatures, as any Kantian will note, that are possessed of a plight, and the plight into which, which we are each born is that we cannot not act. Thus, there is no doing nothing or waiting, for the doing of nothing is a something. It is a moral act, one in which you support the existing constructs of carbon use and the policies of the energy companies, and it looks for all the world just like you are acting as if you have some duty to them, one that you enact every single time you get into that car or you eat a piece of meat. And finally, our abundance as Westerners creates a special duty. We would, of course, have obligations toward the protection, toward protection, even if the climate change was an act of random chaos, as we do as neighbors, for example, when an earthquake occur occurs. But in this case, now that we know that climate change is related closely to the way that we, me, you, live every day, with our abundance and our ease, then we are, in that sense, the perpetrators. It is the now that we know aspect of our lives, the way in which the ordinary, careless, causal acts lead to the devastating yet unseen events, that is the moral failure. We are, as Jewish philosopher Emmanuel Levinas noted, all dwellers in the cities of refuge, people who have committed manslaughter, sort of by mistake, kind of like a man in the Talmud, um, who when tearing down a wall, tosses the stones into a refuge heap, where the poor huddle, and he kills them. Now let's examine this idea of culpability in some detail, because I like teaching Tom at Duquesne University. Here's the text, a conversation about the blame of the, for the death of the poor on the someone who doesn't mean to be doing it. Okay, so, okay, Bambakama, tracked in the Talmud, perhaps you know it, um, 32b. If a man throws a stone into a public thoroughfare and kills, thereby a human being, he is liable to take refuge in the cities of refuge set aside in the Bible for, for such people. Now, does not the offense here committed inadvertently approach will for carelessness? For surely he had to bear in mind that on a public thoroughfare many people were to be found. And yet it states he is liable to take refuge in the city of refuge, and why is he not tried for murder? So that's the question of the Talmud. Is it murder or what if you do it? Any thoughts? City of refuge? No, okay. Rabbi Samuel Ben Yisak said, the offender threw the stone when he was pulling down his wall. But should he not have kept his eyes open, he was pulling it down at night. But even at night time, should he not have kept his eyes open? This is why you say that Jewish thought is an argument. Right? He was, in fact, pulling down his well in the daytime, but he was throwing it towards a dunghill. But how would the picture this dunghill? If many people to be found there, is it not a, ca a case of willful carelessness, intention? If, on the other hand, many were not to be found there, is it not sheer accident? But Papa thereupon said it could indeed have no application unless in the case of a dunghill where it's customary for people to resort at nighttime, but not customary to resort during the day, though it occasionally occurred that some might come to sit there even in the daytime. It is therefore not a case of willful carelessness since it's not customary for people to resort there during the day, nor is it sheer accident since it occasionally occurred that some people did come to sit there even in the daytime. Okay, what's going on in this Talmudic text? Let's walk through it. A man is pulling down an old brick wall, perhaps to build a big, shiny new building, a significant one, perhaps a home for the wealthy. 
The text doesn't say why he's doing it. But nearby it are the garbage heaps of the city, and there is so much waste that it has become a place, a mountain, for the poor to sleep. They sleep without any home at all, on the heaps of garbage, and even in the daytime there are people there, for perhaps now there is nowhere else to rest. Or perhaps now, as it is with our, in our time, that the glittering cities are surrounded by mountains of garbage, and the children of the poorest and the most desperate actually live there. Um, actually, actually live there. We do not even know. It is so easy to kill in this way, not even to see the poor or know that they have lives. It is ordinary even to and live in such a way, produce in such a way, consume in such a way, that our activity, our life choices, and our hungers are the cause of the deaths as certain as the bricks thrown at them in the story. Our cheap t-shirts are made in murderous sweatshops. Our yummy chocolate picked by 12-year-olds who have never tasted it, whose bodies are crippled by the need to pick cocoa beans. And perhaps this is why, notes the Talmud, the roads to the cities of refuge are exponentially wider than any other roads except the King's Highway. For so many, if justice were really enacted, would be crowded onto those roads. Now let me turn to the ethics of our abundance and the reason that our, that our duties as Americans and as scholars are also political acts in a world as much as speech acts. Now we are urged, and we should teach, that ordinary acts really do matter, or ordinary ethics. They do in the sense I spoke of above, in that my existence is contingent on millions of others bearing my burden, and they do as ethical acts that emerge as obligations necessitated by the place that I am situated and the person it allows me to become. They are necessitated by the identities that are created by speech and the in invisible but coherent moral argument every single act implies, and by which my character, as well as my world, is actually shaped. We teach in the broad daylight of the public discussion of religion, and we live as if surrounded and witnessed by this public of which we are a part. I depend on thousands of invisible others to make the world stable and safe. I'm served by people who wake before dawn, by people who clean up the places I go and harvest the food and bring it to my city, which has been built by thousands over hundreds of years, working on streets and sewers. Even our academic conferences, even at the AAR, which I love so much, where we attended, we attended and served by people whose lives are invisible. So by acting as if I could see the face of the other, I might even create a world in which everyone's work is seen and the actions of all matter. On the next step in this logic, the logic of democratic citizenship is to recognize the brute fact that our ordinary, ordinal acts are moral arguments either for or against a certain kind of world, for or against the reality of the faces of the others who always surround us. Thus, the first step in creating a democratic moral life is to look around. It is to understand how the polis is created, where it and we are. If we see the relationships, intersubjective, always present, we know we are not alone. The private act, our act making ideas into words spoken, can be taken out of its isolation and flown about as an identity and as a public appearance. And by this way, we create a public in which the faith argument makes sense. How does that kind of speech create a public life? What can the political act, as opposed to the merely social act, mean? It is the core question of political philosophy, and I would argue in political theology as well. So consider Hannah Arendt. I always consider Hannah Arendt. Arendt, writing philosophy in a one-room apartment, in exile, in New York, her entire word, world, its spaces and squares blown to pieces, like smoke vanished in the winds of the Third Reich. She had, she wrote, lost the world a term for the erasure of the public sphere of public truth-telling, parhesia, and the actions that public speech implies. And instead, it was replaced by the deep interiority of private lives, a time like our own, lived in silence, or of economic exchanges between strangers, or of social administration over public democracy. What would it take, she asked, to create moral and democratic action once again? How does the public world exist? So she argues for an argument an activity that is an enabling agency valued for its dissonance and disagreement on the nature or worth of good as opposed to the celebration of a universal norm of goodness. The power, she says, of the pluralistic discourse is that it needs citizens who are willing to discern and to judge and to advocate for positions and willing, moreover, to, when convinced, organize others toward concerted action, a praxis of action that arises out of speech acts allowing political changes even when all the power of the givenness of history is arrayed against them. 
This public space, where we could debate something like climate change, is rare and endangered by the trivialities of the market, the loneliness of the individual, the pervasive idea that history is organic and not created by the acts of citizens. In the place of the political, another sort of public emerges of the anonymous pole or the beautiful shops or the easy charm of markets. The rise of the social is opposed to the solemnity of the political, she notes. In the social, discernment is lost to accumulation, capital, objects, and social wealth. And the value of the social, the novel, the mutable, and the quick, the abundance, expediency, the sense of fashion, they're all in direct conflict with the values of the political, endurance, freedom, solidarity, responsibility. For a rent, the actions of citizens in public are the actions that define them as individuals with particular and irreplaceable identities. For in the social world, what matters is not their being, but their social role. And as consumers or producers, they are, like their products, completely replaceable and expendable, as the Pope said, a, a throwaway culture. Agency in public allows for defining acts of freedom and difference that are critical to our humanity. Arendt understands that the need for private life, called labor, in which people are, of course, sustained as creatures, needs also a need for work in which the structure and objects of materiality are made. But what is crucial for a real society is natality of the citizen, the birth of the citizen, and the full and flourishing person she recovers, something you know from Aristotle and Aquinas. It's the second miracle of being, the capacity for speech, arguing, for being an adult, to begin again to act in public and to convince others of the need for action, such a rare commodity in our world. If there is no appearance in public, if we don't really try boldly, if there's no self to other speech, no text debated, no talk exchanged, then the capacity for democracy is unwound. The public square can be filled only by social noise or the exchanges of stuff. But the premise of a state, capable of acting, is the first act has to be taken by citizens who will gather and make an occupation, of it, as it were, for the community to gather and speak. The first act is the courage to appear to one another honestly, face to face, so that differences can be seen and commonalities seen, and of course to see that there are so many in the square that you're never alone. My talk, my thinking, my idea for action, I see reflected on your face, but only if we're standing as citizens together. And there is no escaping the fact that one stands one's counted by one's actions in a community to which one is responsible. It is an inescapable community. It is one that is threatened by a danger that is hard to manifest, one that we can know and teach to the human community to which we have a duty to teach, a collective responsibility to be among the people seeking ways to respond, to change the practices that have led us to intense con consumption, the accumulation, the business, the peripatetic seeking that define our world. We need a change of our character. But what are we speaking about? It's here that we can lift up an argument that scripture holds, um, holds this critical place, and more, that these scripture that is a voiced moral appeal that we as scholars and as citizens have heard held dear, and in whose voices we in this sense carry into the world and we speak. We call that theology. There are many rich resources in religious traditions that, that argue for the need to limit desire so as to be a just steward in the world. In the scriptural traditions of Judaism and Christianity and Islam, the Genesis text of creation, the promise of the rainbow, have been used as source texts for the duty to care for the world. Other biblical texts have been located, but there's still so much more to do and an urgency to such reflection. We do not have all the time in the world. In other work, I've looked at how the Jewish tradition sets norms in place by commandment and exemplary behaviors in, for example, war or the treatment of animals or as a reaction to catastrophes. Here I want to take some time to consider a text not necessarily thought of as a text about ecology. I'm interested in ordinal acts of ethics and the Torah's ideas about hospitality. But how can the gesture of hospitality work? If the projections about the way that climate change will affect food production, especially in the global south, are taken seriously, as we heard the other night, we will have strangers who knock at our door and I would argue they are already knocking at our door. Already when crops fail, the poor move to the cities. They are already standing there. Massive climate change, however, has the potential to shut down entire regions, not just individual states. What, we will need so that we can, what do we need so that we can respond justly? So let's turn to the actual event. Ecological disaster, the collapse of the land, and the poor who show up at your door. Actually, it has been considered scripturally. 
Will you invite the stranger in as you are commanded to do? So let's consider Joseph and his brothers. So let's look at Hebrew scripture. This is Genesis 42. The seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began. Just as Joseph had said, don't you feel like Joseph all the time? There was famine in all the other lands, but in the whole land of Egypt, there was food. When all Egypt began to feel the famine, the people cried to Pharaoh for food. Then Pharaoh told the Egyptians, go to Joseph, do what he tells you. When the famine spread over the whole country, let's see, when the famine spread over the, when the, famine spread over the whole country, Joseph opened all the storehouses and he sold grain to the Egyptians for the famine was severe throughout Egypt. And then all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere. When, when, Jacob learned, when, Joseph learned that there was, when Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so we may live and not die. And he said, behold, I have heard there's corn in Egypt. Get down there and buy us from there and we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt and the sons of Israel came to buy grain among those that came. For the famine was in the land of Canaan and Joseph was the governor over the land and it was he that sold to all the people of the land and Joseph's brethren came and they bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. Now we're going to continue the story in the Quran. Same story but different text. Quran uh, Surah 12, 88. When they entered... Joseph's quarters, they said, O oh, you noble one, we have suffered a lot of hardship along with our family. But we have brought inferior goods, but we hope that you will give us full measure and be charitable towards us. God rewards the charitable. He said, Do you recall what you did to Joseph and his brother when you were ignorant? And they said, You must be Joseph. He said, I am Joseph, and here is my brother. God has blessed me. This is because if one leads a righteous life, and steadily perseveres, God never fails to reward the righteous. And they said, by God, God has truly, truly preferred you over us. We were definitely wrong. He said, there's no blame upon you today. May God forgive you. Of all the merciful ones, he is the most merciful. Now that's the story, the story of Joseph. The brothers are a lot nicer in the Quran. Um, opening the door to his failed and broken brothers. Their men themselves they are very unclear on family obligations or the moral realities that he's not, it's not the hospitality of Abraham, all busy and happy and rushing about to serve the angels. It is the risky hospitality, the grudging, uneasy welcome to strangers. They look familiar, but they also look just like your enemies. It's our problem today with Syrians. They do not deserve it. They cannot bless you. The relationship is asymmetrical as in all encounters with the other, says Levinas. You have so much. You have storehouses of stuff, and they are so hungry. You have so much. This is the problem of abundance. Most of us are no doubt underpaid, but yet there is not one of us who could not find a place for another to sleep in our house. No one who could not share a meal or a week of meals, for, another, for that matter. It is twofold. First, abundance is a problem because it is insatiable. It is circular in its action. And second, it's a problem because counting up one's stuff is expressive of a fundamental confusion, the confusion between humans and things, between knowing and owning. With so much at stake, as one adds up the stuff that defines us, it is easy to slip into counting things. Even relationships have a weight and a quantity. It's easy to forget that the field political economy in which the possessive capacity, the ability to dream up plans, the land itself, the capacity to work all of this, each of this, is already only on loan to you, to use to create more than enough for yourself and for the strangers who are part of this theopolitical economy, who come after the harvest and glean. Daniel Levinas, the Jewish philosopher, and outside the subject, argues, face to face with the other man is that a man can indeed appro approach as presence, and then he does approach as such in the sciences of man, had not the thinking one already been exposed beyond the presence of the other, plainly visible in the light to the defenseless nakedness of the face, the lot or misery of the human? Had he not already been exposed to the misery of nakedness, but also to the loneliness of the face, and hence to the categorical imperative of assuming responsibility for that misery? The word of God in that misery committing him to a responsibility impossible to gainsay a uniqueness of the irreplaceable and chosen, 
from unique one to unique one, beyond any kinship and any prior commonality of kind, a closeness and a transcendence outside all subject, outside all synthesis of a mediator. Justice means we are responsible beyond our commitments. You are not free. You are also bound to others beyond your freedom. You are responsible for all your liberty is also fraternity, brotherhood. A risky hospitality transforms the stranger into brother. Your abundant possessions, your stuff into gifts, liberty into fraternity. Another word, um, there's a rabbinic midrash on this moment just before the moment of hospitality. Jacob again sends his sons into the world of famine. And now Jacob saw there was corn. And this is a, a midrash on that line. There was sheber, disaster, meaning famine. There was seber, hope, meaning plenty. That there was sheber, disaster, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt. That there was seber, hope, and Joseph was the governor. That there was sheber, disaster, and they shall serve him, and the Egyptians shall afflict them, the Israelites. That there was seber, hope, and afterward they came out with, grace, with great substance. Another interpretation, now Jacob saw there was corn in Egypt. When Jacob was in, in Egypt, the scripture says, now Jacob saw there was corn in Egypt. Since the day that Joseph was stolen, however, the Holy Spirit departed from him, Jacob, so that he saw, yet he did not see, heard, hear, though he did not hear. Now, why does it not say Jacob saw there was bar, or okel, meaning other grains, but there was sheber, corn, read not sheber, corn, but seber, hope. He saw in the glass of vision there was hope in Egypt. He saw Joseph. Again, look at the transformative alchemy of disaster, the word, into hope, the word, done with the language game of rabbinic theology. Because we are very, more, we are very much more likely to be like Joseph, capable, culpable, able to see the coming famine, to convince the king, to be in technological charge, able to organize a response, and because we have this power, it is possible that my argument, or the argument of the text, is true. It is possible to obtain this power. If we can learn to risk hospitality, we can make the hope that we can see even within our disaster that confronts us. Look how the rabbinic imagination plays with what Jacob or Israel sees. That hope is the name of welcome, and it can be found even in the middle of hopelessness. The obligation, the obliteration of the natural world of grain, the violence of a broken nature, could be redeemed with a single human act. It is this. You are welcome inside. So, People of faith come to the public square and bring the book and tell this story. Speak out of your faith because nowhere else will the risk of hospitality and the grace of forgiveness be lifted up as possible. In fact, to risk in this way, in the context of our current public squares, the real ones with the desperate beggars and the neon and the broken sidewalks and the old men who sleep in the doorways, it would be considered absurd. But consider why we are absurd or silenced Unable to speak is because we largely speak without our text, and that is soundless indeed. Now, there's much more to say about this, both about the text, wonderful text, and about the, other, about the other issues. But our texts illuminate the space between us. They remind us that despite the impossibility of the task, the terrible crisis we face, it is a crisis that needs our careful reflection, our best ideas, and our arguments, written and spoken and rewritten and respoken across the centuries, here is what you need to do when all might be lost, when the crisis engulfs the world, how to be able to open your door to the need and see the face of your family. They look so like you. There was one rainstorm, and the dark waves pounded against the shore all night, and we woke in the morning and walked to a beach covered with trash, the large and the small deletrious of the world, or rather of Los Angeles where I lived, not quite the world. There were beer cans and bottles of salsa, many condoms, and the bright broken toys, and shiny paper that both attracted and then sickened the gulls, and the bodies of the gulls lay about. It looked as broken as if after an assault, and it was partially the Pacific, of course, but partially the citizens. It was our trash. There was, oddly amidst the trash, a 1940s radio tube covered with barnacles, and a Navy flight map at the Afghan-Pakistan border with directions about how to move only at night if captured, and the berries that one could eat there. All of the stuff, all the abundance of our careless world, things tossed over the side of the big boats and the big cars. The storm was our very worst in many years, and it was the last for four, and it narrowed the beach to a rocky sliver. 
But the city turned its back on the sea, and like all hundred-year storms, on the evidence of a disaster. The public square is far from the edges of the city by the sea, the sea, the river, or the mountains. It is, imposs it is possible to speak there about the marketplaces which fill the public square, or the power that animates the public square, and never even to look up, or to understand what is happening. It was the only rain that season, and California lays brown under the daily sun, deep in drought, while the rest of America staggered under the deepest, coldest, longest winter. It is coming, this climate chaos. Every small place beginning to change. We need to live here, and we will need the public arguments only theology can know. So all theology, then, is this speech between us, the saying of the word. It is all political, separating light and darkness, creating a world. But the world not only needs to be set into being every morning, it needs our praxis, repetitive, ordinal. This will mean not only speaking and teaching as if we intended to save the world from this crisis, it will mean you, it will mean me, acting openly in public this way. It is very hard, it is much more than inconvenient, but it is not harder, say, than raising children or any other forward into the future work in which one acts with certainty that things said and done this day will leap beyond me into a time in which I will not live. Act now as if your actions could be seen and judged by the people in the public square in 2050. Most of all, this will mean limiting desire, reconsidering the meaning of having and not having, and finding a difficult way to decide, a different way to decide worth. Thousands and thousands of small acts and one big one. Consider the weight of your acts, consider pausing and turning and seeing the world and saving it. Yes, consider speaking, consider parhesia. Consider more. As president of the American Academy of Religion, I called for a coordinated response. I called for us, people who taught scripture, to heed the admonitions of scripture and to remember that we are to hold a sabbatical year every seven. The next sabbatical year is 2021. And my idea was during that year, we'd reduce our carbon burden dramatically we will not fly to meetings, we will not fly for business, we will, or even for wonderful events like this good one, we will instead turn to the poor of our own cities and work with them to act as if our lives really matter and their lives really matter. We need to plant orchards in our cities, to volunteer in clinics and homeless shelters, to change our practices, most of all to stop, to stop, and then to start and begin again. You who read scripture, Remember that we have a thousand years of knowing, and it will hopefully be there a thousand years later. It comes from Isaiah. It tells us exactly what to do to come close to God and to live in a world where the land has rain at the proper time. It is to share your bread with the hungry. Take the wretched poor into your home. When you see them naked, give them your clothes. Never turn away from your own brother and sister. They are the strangers at the door. Thank you. Okay, do it. <laughs> Any questions? 2021, all set to go? Right. I'll have work to do before then. I, I'm uh, not, let's go to school. Okay. Uh, what, uh, what's been the response to the AAR? You know, this is going to be. So some of my colleagues were happy and supportive and wonderful, wanted to do it. We were in, and some of my colleagues um, hate the thought of not having meat at the American Academy of Religion meeting and not even having a meeting. And people say sad little things like, "But I want to see my friends," <laughs> like, "Want to see friends? Climate destruction." You know, so it, it, people are still working on it. It's very hard. This is a wonderful meeting. The food was great. We didn't need to eat turkey and sugary things. We didn't, we don't, we, every bit of our lives matters, every gesture, every tiny thing. And when we get overwhelmed by how large the task is, think every tiny thing is one more thing on one side of the ledger or the other. So, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I became a vegetarian actually last year, it was a sabbatical year last year, and because I could no longer support that kind of um, consumption. 
And we have a lot to do. We have a lot to do. So there is going to be a petition, and anyone can ask me that, I'll send one to you, that each university president and board has to make a decision about reducing um, their carbon burden at the university level. My theory on this is I don't have any pull at the UN. I wish I did. I wish I was president of a whole country, right? But no, alas. And so, no, they want Trump instead of Zoloth. What can I say? So, <laughs> but, but I have a lot of power at my middle-level institution, my synagogue, right? My synagogue, my PTA, my university. And if we work on those middle-level institutions, we have tremendous power there. And so that was my theory about the sabbatical year. If every single one of you convinces every single one of your middle-range institutions to take 2021 as the year to live an ideal way and not to fly and not to hold your meeting, it would happen. But it takes every single one of you to say, in 2021, we're not having a meeting. We're not going to do it. We're going to work in our own cities, talk to the people we live with. We're going to recreate our places as green and possible. We're not going to live as if we need six Earths. I only need three Earths, by the way. I don't know what, what you're doing. But still, so that's, that's my theory. Now, uh, this petition, I think, will begin to build slowly um, towards it. But I think it's up to you. Anyone a member of the AAR here? See, there you go. In every one of your sections, hi Aaron, in every one of your sections, bring it back because it has to be a grassroots movement. People know what I want, but it has to be a grassroots movement. And I think we can build for it. It's completely possible. Yes. Thanks, Maureen. That was a wonderful presentation. So let me ask a question as a participant and not as a conference. Okay, right, right, right. Um, it relates to the NEA because you were broadly about mm -hmm. the power of the Bible, the rhetoric. Right. Uh, it, it, it is interesting in this nation, you know, I'm coming from Europe, which is a secularized nation that's very well, much given up in its original beliefs and it's more um, fanciful than, you know, heartfelt religion oftentimes mm -hmm. that we encounter. Whereas in this nation, uh, although the point of counterpart in Europe is it's not as consumerist as we are in this country, but here we are in this country, we have a continent that's consumerist in its orientation, but very biblical. Mm -hmm. so it takes its faith seriously. But there's a real curiosity and an opportunity, and I'm wondering about your reaction to this, uh, this possibility. That the religious right in this country, which seems to be so powerfully against the uh, evidence of climate change, mm -hmm. what, what do you suggest we can do in our synagogues, in our temples, in our churches, to use the power of the Bible to say, you've got a mm -hmm. flat wrong there, right? Yeah. Well, this is why I'm going for hospitality. Because um, the, the, the religious right that dominates the American South actually has the highest rate of charitable giving uh, pr pr compared to any other American category and has the highest rate of taking children in from the foster care system and keeping them and adopting them. So the capacity for hospitality to the stranger is abundantly part of that faith community. And I, that's why that's the, that's the ask, right? That's the ask. Um, the Pope's... Um, the Pope's recollection for us that this is, we, we share this world as our home, might have that kind of resonance. I try to find texts that are common to three faith traditions at least, covers a lot of Americans and they're taken seriously. The Joseph story for me is a critically important um, story because it's such a central part of, of the Torah and such a central part of the Quran. Um, so that story in which you're negotiating with power, you're exchanged from your family, you take your family in, you, 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 um, you see the failure of large organizational strategies. It's such a rich story for, for Bible study. So my theory is if, it's, if we, that's, that's the way we think through. Americans really, in general, are believers. We have to understand that if the, we believe the texts are true, then we have something to talk about. We have something in common already with the religious right. But see, I have to say, much of our... Um, railing against in climate change ethics is against climate deniers. And I decided there's plenty of people who are angry about climate deniers and people are paying the, the, you know, the tobacco companies who are paying to create denial. I'm not worried about that. That's covered. What I want to think about is our denial, my denial, right? The fact that I spent this is 181.64 kgs of carbon to get here and back, right? Why didn't I take the time to get on a, on a, um, a train? What was that about? I didn't know better. What's with the train? I wanted more time. I mean, what's, because we're trying to do so much. So, so it's our denial. It's, it's meat. It's bottled water. It's bananas in the Northern Hemisphere. It's every tiny thing 
by which we deny what we know. So the denial that I want us to think about as climate change activists is the den our own denial. Because I believe if we live sincerely and make our bodies and our practices signs, then we're believable. Then we have integrity. And people look at that and they see that. Right? And so that, and it's, it's going to take a lot of work and it's going gonna, it's gonna to mean not doing. It's going to mean sacrifice at the center of your religious, of your religious life, which of course used to be the center of your religious life. Right? And, and so figuring out what's, what's it worth to me? What can I give up? What can I sacrifice? And that's, it's not, I mean, it's not going to be fun. It's going to be less happy making on some level. Um, and I think we have, to, we have to be real about that. We have to be real about that. Right? If, 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 the, if, the, um, if the Mexican desert collapses as it is tending, the huge wave of displaced farmers be coming into our America. Not, now it's happening in Europe because the, because the Fertile Crescent Eastern Mediterraneans had the horrible drought, but now it's in the Western states. You know, so that's, it's really something for us to take on. But in, I think in these terms, in terms of a sharing world, making the world more hospitable. So. I just want to explore another text. In so many texts. Yeah, you're good. Go ahead. Comments on it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm amazed that in Micah 6, where the prophet uh, writes about the court case, and, uh, God is not the judge. He's the plaintiff or the God. Mm -hmm. He's not the judge or the plaintiff. But it's the earth that is the judge. And so Micah says, stand up, plead your case before the mountains. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if, that, if in that prophetic tradition there is something so I just haven't, luckily for me, I just taught that very text um, on, on Wednesday to my, my class on Jewish ethics. So I can tell you all about Micah 6. So Micah 6 begins with the same, in, with the same trope that Isaiah 58 begins. Shout out. Shout out. Raise your voice like a shofar. This one is shout out to the mountain. So this large claim calling in the world to, to attend to you. God in this sense, in both Isaiah and in the Micah text, is... Um, is, is called to and answers Hineni, which is the classic example. Usually it's Abraham or Moses that answers Hineni. Right? But God, in this sense, is the answerer to the cry of the, that the prophet wants the people to cry. For A.J. Heschel, I wait until way, way too much for this, but A.J. Heschel really believes that the prophetic voice is the voice of the man who is um, engaged in, in, in religious empathy with God, sees Sees with God the catastrophe of, of the Israelite nation. Sees that they've, they've, they're not taking good care of their land. And they're tempted to buy temples and have fancy stuff. And wants to call them out because of his empathetic relationship, sympathetic relationship with the divine, with the divine loss. And that's the role of the prophet in those two texts. Um, Isaiah 6 classically ends with this. So what do you need to do? And it's just, you know, tell the truth. Walk humbly with your God, you know. Um, and be compassion. The word for judgment and is followed by the word for chesed, for mercy. Do judgment, ju be just and merciful and walk humbly. Make your steps little. So that's, and it, it's very, do a very similar, it calls that, Isaiah called 58 calls that for Micah 6, I think. So. Is there a hand over there? Um, so I'm from more of the science background. I and I guess I just don't totally understand how if you're advocating for everybody to be like more hospitable and take less for yourself, how that really is going to help all the people in Syria if they still don't have access to the things that they need to help themselves. Well, the, the, the situation in Syria as the, um, in the proceedings of the National Academy of Science, it's not just me who thought this up, but the, um, the National Academy of the United States thought this up and re re did, looked at that 165-page report, saw that it had been ignored, and what they said is it's, it's over for northern, northern Eastern Syria, ironically the place where ISIS is the strongest, because they said, oh, yeah, we'll give you water. Sure. We'll set up an economy. But the, the, um, what happened is the water table, so many wells were sunk, the water table is now absent. So the great pepper industry and the great um, richness of the Fertile Crescent has really been 
that's really been destroyed. So they can't go back. There's no sort of place for them to go back. They're going to have to figure out, we're going to have to figure out how to live um, with people in our lovely land from places that can't, be, can't sustain them anymore. Just like huge parts of the United States don't have enough water. You know, large parts of Montana can't be lived in. We're going to have to figure out how to rethink the world. Maybe, and it's possible that nation to nation isn't the right calculus, but um, need to abundance, that exchange is going to have to be part of what we think through. Now, I'm, and I'm more hopeful that, because, <laughs> because I'm a, 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 a little bit of a pessimist, I'm a Jew, it's all going to, so, so, so we're going to have to, we should begin thinking now what virtues we need as, a, as humanity to cope with the fact that we've already gotten perhaps to three degrees warmer. And that's going to mean taking in refugees, right? It's, this, this year it's Syrians. Next year it could be Somalis or it could be Bangladeshi, Bangladeshis. We're going to have to figure this out. We live in the upper Midwest. I live in the upper Midwest. You live just, just a little bit east of us. We live in a lucky, abundant place with 20% of the world's water right there. And that's, that incurs some responsibility. So, that, that's, so hopefully, look, everybody stands in front of words and makes an argument. Sometimes it's the Constitution. And sometimes it's a biblical text. But they're both standing in front of, of truth claims um, and trying to argue from that truth to make a just, justify the set of behaviors. So these are my, these are my truth claims. And, and when we do this as scholars of religion, we're doing it because we've believed you as scientists. We believe your truth claims. And we're answering back, hear me, with our truth claims. So that's what I consider. There's a person right there. I like that idea. It's very heartening to know that there's communities of people with the resources to do that kind of thing. I'm worried about um, South Chicago, basically, where the murder rate just, where, where the worst murder rate, and like, the, it's a horrible environment to live in. And those people want a thousand year plan too, and they don't have the resources. So there's going to be two things going on at least, which is everybody that can and, you know, does that, but but most people can't, right? Most people are subject to my consumption. Most people are, are living in wretched poverty, and South Chicago is not even the worst wretched poverty in the United States. People all have, you know, machines to wash their clothes and to keep their houses warm in the, in the winter. So it's not, it's not wretched, right? It's, it's not fair, but it's not wretched. There's far worse situations of despair, and the way I live contributes to it. And that's what I want to keep us focusing on over and over and over again that we, it's a, an accident of history that I'm not living in Bangladesh or in a slum in Thailand. It's just an accident of, of where we all end up and where our history has taken us. So the social choices that we've made enable us to take on 
a larger burden, and it is our obligation then to enact it. I've long um, opposed human rights language because I think it, it's um, what we need is human duties language. Right? <laughs> that we have absolute I I duties that are constituent of ourselves, and these duties um, that I think are given to us by God in the Torah. But you, you know, can, Christians have another story about that. But we have these intrinsic duties that, are, that constitute what it is to be a human person. The Pope's brilliant work echoes the language of Deuteronomy. If it is your character, if you uh, have idolatrous ideas, if you think that something else is more important and you worship that other thing, the land will cease to be a land. With, with the, this, the skies will be like iron in the... In the, the Deuteronomy, the, the text. The skies will be like iron, not because of your agricultural practices, but because of your character, your desire. So that, that I think, is really, um, that's a great gift to us to be reminded of that. And I think we just have to continue to keep speaking that story. The character is what, character, desire, will, that's what's driving. That's what's driving this, this catastrophe. Can you all join me in thanking Dr. Lori?